Good evening, and welcome to Everyday Storytelling. First up, we are going to be reading a Bible verse by Jonathan. And then we are going to be reading the Bible, both from Romans. And then we are going to be doing the synopsis with Kimberly and then we are going to be reading Around the World in 80 Days. I hope you enjoy. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe and hit the bell to never miss another video. Let's go to JJ. to be doing Romans 15 4 so I don't have my book for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope that is the verse of the day I memorized it because of Awana's well Howdy! How is everyone doing today? So, I'm going to be reading Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Okay, and let's go ahead and I'm going to wait just one minute. We have a drum roll awaiting the scripture. Okay, now it's going to begin. <laughs> English Standard Version, here we go. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not be present sorry, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart 
to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you were now you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the end of Romans chapter 6. I hope that God is blessing you with the reading of his scripture. Um, there's a lot that I could say in that. I just don't have time. I need to have another podcast, I think, um, in order to really have any input. All right, so in the last chapter, past part two, went into the, is it a Buddhist temple there in Bombay? And um, the priests uh, really didn't like him being in the Buddhist temple. I don't think he even took off his shoes, which was a requirement, but he wasn't even allowed to be in there because he's a, he's a Christian and only Buddhists are allowed to be in there. And so the priests, they took out their knives and they killed him. And then he died. And that is the end of the story. Uh, Mr. Fogg was so full of grief that he ended his, his adventure and went straight back to London. The end. For real, Dad? Here's Kimberly to say how it really happened. But then the train crashed while he was... Okay. So... What actually happened was, um, in his rush to get out, um, Passepartout left his shoes and all of the new clothes that he had gotten, um, in the temple, because the priest didn't like him, like Dad said, and then they went on, and, um, I think it's Fix? Yeah, Fix, uh, continued after them only becoming more and more convinced that they were the burglars um, as time went on. They, or is it mostly... He, mostly, just, just mostly, Mr. yeah, mostly just Mr. Fogg. He's becoming more convinced by the second, and um, he's actually um, been very nice to Passepartout, but I still think that Passepartout is the real mastermind here. Just bold predictions. <laughs> I could be completely wrong. Um, but then they they went over to, um, to like, India, right? Or was it Africa? They're in India, yes. Yeah, yeah they what got to... What happened with the train? Oh, the train, the tracks ended because it wasn't completely, um, as far as it said, but... I'm dead. But they, um, but Mr. Fogg had accounted for the backtracking. So he bought an elephant. He bought a whole elephant and then hired somebody as his guide. I'm not even joking. That's crazy. Like, where is he going to, where is he going to keep the elephant? So, probably give it to the guide when he's done. Yeah, probably. So then, um, he is going to be in the jungle for a while now. I'm going to hand it off to Dad, who's going to read us a story. Hello again! Hi, two people! Thank you for joining us. We're on Chapter 12. Um, is that right? Yes. Chapter 12 of Around the World in 80, I can't talk, Around the World in 80 Days. So this is chapter 12, 
What? Oh, okay. This is chapter 12, in which Phileas Fogg and his companions venture across the Indian forests and what ensued. If you hear the dog barking in the background, it's because we have our window open. Because it's finally less than 90 degrees. Yay! In order to shorten the journey, the guide passed to the left of the line where the railway was still in process of being built. This line, owing to the capricious turnings of the Vin Vintia Mountains, did not pursue a straight course. The Parsi, who was quite familiar with the roads and paths in the district, declared that they would gain 20 miles by striking directly through the forest. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromartry plunged to the neck in the peculiar hudas provided for them were horribly jostled by the swift trotting of the elephant, spurred on as he was by the skillful Parsi. But they endured the discomfort with true British phlegm, talking little and scarcely able to catch a glimpse of each other. As for Passepartout, who was mounted on the, boat, on the beast's back and received the direct force of each concussion as he trod along, he was very careful in accordance with his master's advice to keep his tongue from between his teeth, as it would otherwise have been bitten off short. The worthy fellow bounced from the elephant's neck to his rump and vaulted like a clown on a springboard, yet he laughed in the midst of his bouncing and from time to time took a piece of sugar out of his pocket and inserted it in Keonu's trunk, that's the elephant, who received it without, who received it without in the least slackening his regular trot. After two hours, the guide stopped the elephant and gave him an hour for rest, during which Keone, after quenching his thirst at the neighboring spring, set to devouring the branches and shrubs round about him. Neither Sir Francis nor Mr. Fogg regretted the delay, and both descended from uh, with a feeling of relief. "'Why, he's made of iron!' exclaimed the general, gazing admiringly on Keone. "'Or of forged iron!' replied Passepartout, as he set about preparing a hasty breakfast. At noon the Parsi gave the, the signal of departure. The country soon presented a very savage aspect. Copses of dates and dwarf palms succeeded the succeeded the dense forests, then vast dry plains dotted with scanty shrubs and sown with great blocks of cyanite. All this, not cyanide, but cyanite. Um, all this portion of Bundelkund, which is little frequented by travelers, is inhabited by a fanatical population hardened in the most horrible practices of the Hindu faith. The English have not been able to secure complete dominion over this territory, which is subjected to the influence of rajas, whom it is almost impossible to reach in the inaccessible mountain fastnesses. The travelers several times saw bands of ferocious Indians, who then they perceived the elephant striding across country made angry and threatening motions. The Parsi avoided them as much as possible. Few animals were observed on the route. Even the monkeys hurried from their path with contortions and grimaces when, which convulsed Passepartout with laughter. In the midst of his gaiety, however, one thought troubled the worthy servant. What would Mr. Fogg do with the elephant when he got to Allahabad? Would he carry him on with him? Impossible. The cost of transporting him would make him ruin ruinously expensive. Would he sell him or set him free? The estim estimable beast certainly deserves some consideration. Should Mr. Fogg choose to make him, Passepartout, a present of Keone, he would be very much embarrassed, and these thoughts did not cease worrying him for a long time. The principal chain of the Ventius was crossed by eight in the evening, and another halt was made on the northern slope in a ruined bungalow. They had gone nearly twenty-five miles that day, and an equal distance still separated them from the station of Allahabad. The night was cold. The Parsi lit a fire in the bungalow with a few dry branches, and the warmth was very grateful. The provisions purchased at Colby sufficed for supper, and the travelers ate ravenously. The conversation beginning with a few disconnected 
phrases soon gave place to loud, uh, to loud and steady snores. The guide watched Keone, who slept standing, bolstering himself against the trunk of a large tree. Nothing occurred during the night to disturb the slumberers, although occasional growls from panthers and chatterings of monkeys broke the silence. The more formidable beasts made no cries or hostile demonstration against the occupants of the bungalow. Sir Francis slept heavily, like an honest soldier overcome with fatigue. Passepartout was wrapped in uneasy dreams of the bouncing of the day before, as for Mr. Fogg, he slumbered as peacefully as if he had been in his Cyrene mansion in Seville Row. There's those dogs I was talking about. The journey was resumed at six in the morning. The guide hoped to reach Allahabad by evening. In that case, Mr. Fogg would only lose a part of the 48 hours saved since the beginning of the tour. Keone, resuming his rapid gait, soon descended the lower spurs of the Vendias, and toward noon they passed by the village of Kalingur on the Kani, one of the branches of the Ganges. The guide avoided inhabited places, thinking it safer to keep the open country which lies along the first depressions of the basin of the great river. Allahabad was now only twelve miles to the northeast. They stopped under a clump of bananas, the fruit of which, as healthy as bread and as succulent as cream, was amply partaken of partaken of and appreciated. In other words, they had a lot of bananas, and they also had a lot of appeal. At <laughs> two o'clock, the guide entered a thick forest which extended several miles. He preferred to travel under cover of the woods. They had not as yet had any unpleasant encounters, and the journey seemed on the point of being successfully accomplished. When the elephant became restless, suddenly stopped. Becoming restless, suddenly stopped. It was then four o'clock. "'What's the matter?' asked Sir Francis, putting out his head. "'I don't know, officer,' replied the Parsi, listening attentively to, the, to a confused murmur which came through the thick branches. The murmur soon became more distinct. It now seemed like a distant concert of human voices accompanied by brass instruments.' Passepartout was all eyes and ears. Mr. Fogg patiently waited without a word. The Parsi jumped to the ground, fastened the elephant to a tree, and plunged into the thicket. He soon returned, saying, A procession of Brahm Brahmins is coming this way. We must prevent their seeing us, if possible. The guide unloosed the elephant and led him into a thicket, at the same time asking the travelers not to stir. He held himself ready to bestride the animal at a moment's notice, should flight become necessary, but he evidently thought that the procession of the faithful would pass without perceiving them amid the thick foliage in which they were wholly concealed. The discord discordant tones of the voices and instruments drew nearer and now droning songs mingled with the sound of the tambourines and the cymbals the head of the procession soon appeared beneath the trees a hundred paces away and a strange figures who performed the religious ceremony were easily distinguished through the branches first came the priests with mitres on their heads and clothed in long lace robes, they were surrounded by men, women, and children who sang a kind of lugubrious psalm interpreted at regular intervals by the tambourines. Excuse me. Interrupted, not interpreted, interrupted at regular intervals by the tambourines and cymbals, while behind them was drawn a car with large wheels. I'm guessing this isn't a Model T, the spokes of which represented serpents entwined with each other. Upon the car, which was drawn by four richly capricious zebus, stood a hideous statue with four arms, the body colored a dull red with haggard eyes, disheveled hair, protruding tongue, and lips tinted with beetle. It stood upright upon the figure of a prostrate and headless giant. Sir Francis, recognizing the statue, whispered, The goddess Kali, the goddess of love and death. Of death, perhaps, muttered back Passepartout, but of love, that ugly old hag, never! 
the Parsi made a motion to keep silence. A group of old fakirs were capering and making a wild ado round the statue. These were striped with ochre and covered with cuts whence their blood issued drop by drop. Stupid fanatics who, in the great Indian ceremonies, still throw themselves under the wheels of juggernaut. Some Brahmins, clad in all the sumptuousness of the oriental apparel and leading a woman who faltered at every step followed this woman was young and as fair as a european her head and neck shoulders ears arms hands and toes were loaded down with jewels and gems with bracelets earrings and rings while a tunic bordered with gold and covered with a light muslin robe mu yeah, muslin, excuse me, robe, betrayed the outline of her form. Picture um, the Temple of Doom right here, except it's out in the open. The guards who followed the young woman presented a violent contrast to her, armed as they were with naked sabers hung at their waists and long damascened pistols, and bearing a corpse on a palanquin. It was the body of an old man, gorgeously arrayed in the habiliments ha habil habil of a raja, wearing, as in life, a turban embroidered with pearls, a robe of tissue of silk and gold, a scarf of cashmere sewed with diamonds, and the, and the magnificent weapons of a Hindu prince. Next came the musicians and a rear guard of capering fakirs whose cries sometimes drowned the noise of the instruments. These closed the procession. Sir Francis... Excuse me. Sir Francis watched the procession with a sad countenance, and turning to the guide said, A suti? The Parsi nodded and put his finger to his lips. The procession slowly wound under the trees, and soon its last ranks disappeared in the depths of the wood. The songs... Oh, okay, sorry. The songs gradually died away. Occasionally, cries were heard in the distance, until at last all was silence again. Phileas Fogg had heard what Sir Francis said, and, as soon as the procession had disappeared, asked, What is a suti? A suti, returned the general, is a human sacrifice, but a voluntary one. The woman you have just seen will be burned tomorrow at the dawn of day. Oh, the scoundrels! cried Passepartout, who could, not trespa uh, who could not repress his indignation. And the corpse? asked Mr. Fogg. Is that the prince, her husband? said the guide. Is that of the prince, her husband? said the guide. An independent rajah of Bundelkund. Is it possible, resumed Phileas Fogg, his voice betraying not the least emotion, that these barbarous customs still exist in India, and that the English have been unable to put a stop to them? These sacrifices do not occur in the larger portion of India, replied Sir Francis, but we have no power over these savage territories, and especially here in Bundelkund. The whole district north of the Vidyas is the theater of incessant murders and pillage. The poor wretch, exclaimed Passepartout, to be burned alive? Yes, returned Sir Francis, burned alive. And if she were not, you cannot conceive what treatment she would be obliged to submit to from her relatives. They would shave off her hair, feed her on a scanty allowance of rice, treat her with contempt. She would be looked upon as an unclean creature and would die in some corner like a scurvy dog. The prospect of so frightful an existence drives these poor creatures to the sacrifice much more than love or religious fanaticism. Sometimes, however, the sacrifice is really voluntary, and it requires the active interference of the government to prevent it. Several years ago, when I was living at Bombay, a young widow asked permission of the governor to be burned along with her husband's body, but as you may imagine, he refused." The woman left the town, took refuge with an independent rajah, and there carried out her self-devoted purpose. While Sir Francis was speaking, the guide shook his head several times, and now said, The sacrifice which will take place tomorrow at dawn is not a voluntary one. How do you know? Everybody knows about this affair in Bundelkund. 
but the wretched creature did not seem to be making any resistance, observed Sir Francis. That was because they had intoxicated her with the fumes of hemp and opium. But where are they taking her? To the pagoda of Pilagi, two miles from here, she will pass the night there. And the sacrifice will take place tomorrow at the first light of dawn. The guide now led the elephant out of the thicket and leapt upon his neck, just at the moment that he was about to urge Keone forward with a peculiar whistle, Mr. Fogg stopped him, and turning to Sir Francis Cromartry, said, Suppose we save this woman. Save the woman, Mr. Fogg? I have yet twelve hours to spare. I can devote them to that. Why, you are a man of heart. Sometimes, replied Phileas Fogg quietly, when I have the time. Chapter 13 in which Passepartout receives a new proof that fortune favors the brave. The project was a bold one, full of difficulty, perhaps impracticable, impract, impracticable, impracticable. Mr. Fogg was going to risk life, or at least liberty, and therefore the success of his tour, but he did not hesitate, and he found in Sir Francis Cromartry an enthusiastic ally. As for Passepartout, he was ready for anything that might be proposed. His master's idea charmed him. He perceived a heart, a soul, under that icy exterior. He began to love Phileas Fogg. There remained the guide. What course would he adopt? Would he not take part with the Indians? In default of his assistance, it was necessary to be assured of his neutrality. Sir Francis frankly put the question to him. Officers, replied the guide, I am a Parsi, and this woman is a Parsi. Command me as you will. Excellent, said Mr. Fogg. However, resumed the guide, it is certain, not only that we shall risk our lives, but horrible tortures, if we are taken. That is foreseen, replied Mr. Fogg. I think we must wait till night before acting. I think so, said the guide. The worthy Indian then gave some account of the victim, who he said was a celebrated beauty of the Parsi race and the daughter of a wealthy Bombay merchant. She had received a thoroughly English education in that city and from her manners and intelligence would be thought a European. Her name was Aouda. Left an orphan, she was married against her will to the old Raja of Bundukund, and knowing the fate that awaited her, she escaped, was retaken, and devoted to the Raja's relatives, who had an interest in her death, to the sacrifice from which it came she could not escape, which it seemed she could not escape. The Parsi's narrative only confirmed Mr. Fogg and his companions in their gen generous design. It was decided that their guide should direct the elephant toward the pagoda of Pilagi, which he accordingly approached as quickly as possible. They halted half an hour afterward in a copse some five hundred feet from the pagoda, where they were well concealed, but they could hear the groans and cries of the fakirs distinctly. Then they discussed the means of getting at the victim. The guide was familiar with the pagoda of Pelagi, in which, as he declared, the young woman was imprisoned. Could they enter any of its doors while the whole party of Indians was plunged in a drunken sleep, or was it safer to attempt to make a hole in the walls? This could only be determined at the moment and the place themselves, but it was certain that the abduction must be made that night, and not when, at break of day, the victim was led to her funeral pyre. Then no human intervention could save her. As soon as night fell, about six o'clock, they decided to make a reconnaissance around the pagoda. The cries of the fakirs were just ceasing. The Indians were in the act of plunging themselves into drunkenness caused by liquid opium mingled with hemp, and it might be possible to slip between them to the temple itself. The Parsi, leading the others, noiselessly crept through the wood, and in ten minutes they found themselves on the banks of a small stream, whence by the light of the rosin torches they perceived a pyre of wood, on the top of which lay the embalmed body of the Raja, which was to be burned with his wife. The pagoda, whose minarets loomed above the trees in the deepening dusk, stood a hundred steps away. Come 
whispered the guide. He slipped more cautiously than ever through the brush, followed by his companions. The silence around was only broken by the low murmuring of the wind among the branches. Soon the Parsi stopped on the borders of the glade, which was lit up by the torches. The ground was covered by groups of the Indians, motionless in their drunken sleep. It seemed a battlefield strewn with the dead. Men, women, and children lay together. In the background, among the trees, the pagoda of Pelagi loomed indistinctly. Much to the guide's disappointment, the guards of the Raja, lighted by torches, were watching at the doors and marching to and fro with naked sabers. Probably the priests, too, were watching within. The Parsi, now convinced that it was impossible to force an entrance to the temple, advanced no farther, but led his companions back again. Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis Cromartry also saw that nothing could be attempted in that direction. They stopped and engaged in a whispered colloquy. It is only eight now, said the brigadier, and these guards may also go to sleep. It is not impossible, returned the Parsi. They lay down at the foot of a tree and waited. The time seemed long. The guide ever and anon left them to take an observation on the edge of the wood. But the guards watched steadily by the glare of the torches, and a dim light crept through the windows of the pagoda. They waited till midnight, but no change took place among the guards, and it became apparent that their yielding to sleep could not be counted on. The, the other plan must be carried out. An opening in the walls of the pagoda must be made. It remained to ascertain whether the priests were watching by the side of their victim as assiduously as were the soldiers at the door. After a last consultation, the guide announced that he was ready for the attempt and advanced, followed by the others. They took a roundabout way so as to get at the pagoda on the rear. They reached the walls about half past twelve without having met anyone. Here there was no guard, nor were there either windows or doors. The night was dark, the moon on the wane, scarcely left the horizon, and was covered with heavy clouds. The height of the trees deepened the darkness. It was not enough to reach the walls. An opening in them must be accomplished, and to attain this purpose, the party only had their pocket knives. Happily, the temple walls were built of brick and wood, which could be penetrated with little difficulty. After one brick had been taken out, the rest would yield easily. They set noiselessly to work, and the Parsi on one side and Passepartout on the other began to loosen the bricks so as to make an aperture two feet wide. They were getting on rapidly when suddenly a cry was heard in the interior of the temple, followed almost instantly by other cries re replying from the outside. Passepartout and the guide stopped. Had they been heard? Was the alarm being given? Common prudence urged them to retire, and they did so, followed by Phileas Fogg and Sir Francis. They again hid themselves in the wood and waited till the disturbance, whatever it might be, ceased, holding themselves ready to resume their attempt without delay. But, awkwardly enough, the guards now appeared at the rear of the temple and were installed and, and there installed themselves in readiness to prevent a surprise. It would be difficult to describe the disappointment of the party thus interrupted in their work. They could not now reach the victims. The victim, how then could they save her? Sir Francis shook his fists. Passepartout was beside himself, and the guide gnashed his teeth with rage. The tranquil fog waited without betraying any emotion. We have nothing to do but go away, whispered Sir Francis. "'Nothing but go away,' echoed the guide. "'Stop!' said Fogg. "'I am only due at Allahabad tomorrow before noon.' "'But what can you hope to do?' asked Sir Francis. "'In a few hours it will be daylight, "'and the chance which now seems lost "'may present itself at the last moment.' "'Sir Francis would have liked to read Phileas Fogg's eyes. "'What was this cool Englishman thinking of? "'Was he planning to make a rush for the young woman "'at the very moment of the sacrifice "'and boldly snatch her from her executioners? 
This would be utter folly, and it would be hard to admit that Fogg was such a fool. It was hard to, to admit that. Sir Francis consented, however, to remain to the end of this terrible drama. The guide led them to the rear of the glade, where they were able to observe the sleeping groups. Meanwhile, Passepartout, who had perched himself on the lower branches of a tree, was revolving an idea which had at first struck him like a flash, and which was now firmly lodged in his brain. He had commenced by saying to himself, "'What folly!' And then he repeated, Why not, after all? It's a chance, perhaps the only one, and with such sorts. Thinking thus, he slipped with the suppleness of a serpent to the lowest branches, the ends of which bent almost to the ground. The hours passed, and the lighter shades now announced the approach of day, though it was not yet light. This was the moment. The slumbering multitude became animated. The tambourines sounded. Songs and cries arose. The hour of the sacrifice had come. The doors of the pagoda swung open, and a bright light escaped from its interior, in the midst of which Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis espied the victim. She seemed having shaken off the stupor of intoxication, to be striving to escape from her executioner. Sir Francis' heart throbbed and convulsively seized Mr. Fogg's hand, found in it an open knife. Just at this moment the crowd began to move. The young woman had again fallen into a stupor caused by the fumes of hemp and passed among the fakirs who escorted her with their wild religious cries. Phileas Fogg and his companions, mingling in the rear ranks of the crowd, followed, and in two minutes they reached the banks of the stream and stopped fifty paces from the pyre, upon which still lay the rajah's corpse. In the semi-obscurity they saw the victim, quite senseless, stretched out beside her husband's body. Then a torch was brought, and the wood, soaked with oil, instantly took fire. At this moment Sir Francis and the guide seized Phileas Fogg, who, in an instant of mad generosity, was about to rush upon the pyre. But he had quickly pushed them aside when the whole scene suddenly changed. A cry of terror arose. The whole multitude prostrated themselves, terror-stricken on the ground. The old Raja was not dead then, since he rose of a sudden like a specter, took up his wife in his arms, and descended from the pyre in the midst of the clouds of smoke which only heightened his ghostly appearance. Fakirs and soldiers and priests, seized with instant terror, lay there with their faces on the ground, not daring to lift their eyes and behold such a prodigy. The inanimate victim was borne along by the vigorous arms which supported her, and which she did not seem in the least to burden. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis stood erect, and the Parsi bowed his head, and Passepartout was no doubt scarcely less stupefied, the resuscitated Raja approached Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg, and in an abrupt tone said, Let us be off. It was Passepartout himself, who had slipped upon the pyre in the midst of the smoke, and profiting by the still overhanging darkness, had delivered the young woman from death. It was Passepartout who, pl playing his part with a happy audacity, had passed through the crowd amid the general terror. A moment after all, four of the party had disappeared in the woods, and the elephant was bearing them away at a rapid pace. But the cries and noise, and a ball which whizzed through Phileas Fogg's hair, apprised that the trick had been discovered. The old Raja's body indeed now appeared upon the burning pyre, and the priests, recovered from their terror, perceived that an abduction had taken place. They hastened into the forest, followed by the soldiers, who fired a volley after the fugitives, but the latter rapidly increased the distance between them, and ere long found themselves beyond the reach of the bullets and arrows." That is the end of chapter 13 and is where we will rest today. So I'm glad that you're enjoying the story. 
However, we are going to stop there today, and I hope that you join us next time for Heavy D Storytelling. And JJ and Kimberly both look like they are just burning to give us some more content for today's episode. So, which one of you is going first? Kim. Kim's going first, and God bless you. Have a good night. Um, I have an art gallery. Oh, ow. <laughs> Poked my nose. <laughs> Ta-da! I just finished this up. And then... I did this one, too. <laughs> that is really pretty. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to JJ, who wanted to do something. I am your host, your ghost host. <laughs> if you know what that's from, I'm going to say another line. <laughs> and no flash pictures, please. <laughs> so, hope you guys enjoy. Mom, my mom did my hair. So, if you guys enjoyed, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and follow me in the video. I already said that. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs> Kindly step into the room one at a time, please. There's no turning back now.